Okay, so I'd like to first thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak today. So I'm in the lab of Dr. Helen Blau. Unfortunately, she couldn't come today, but um, I hope to present um, the work in our lab. So our lab focuses on skeletal muscle. And just to give a bit of background, um, unfortunately, nowadays, we live a longer time, but we just live a longer time with a number of chronic diseases. So what we call optimal longevity is to increase this lifespan, but by decreasing the number of uh, these chronic diseases. So we believe that having healthy muscles matters in this aspect, and we all know the benefits, of, for example, of exercise during aging. So skeletal muscle is probably the largest tissue in the body. It composes 40% of our body mass, and it is actually quite regenerative, and unfortunately it declines with aging um, with a condition known as sarcopenia, or muscle wasting. So specifically, in our lab, we, we work on muscle stem cells. So this is a unique uh, population of cells, which are quite rare, and they lie on top of the muscle fibers, and they are usually quiescent, but upon injury or, for example, exercise, these cells uh, leave the quiescent stage, they become activated, proliferate, and then they commit, and these committed cells are the ones that will differentiate and give rise to the newly formed fibers to regenerate injured areas. So it's actually quite impressive that a single stem cell can actually give rise to a full fiber. So we perform these engraftment assays where we take GFP luciferase donor muscle stem cells and we engraft them into irradiated donors um, intramuscularly. And then by bioluminescence, we can track um, non-invasively the levels of engraftment. So by injecting single cells, you can actually see that it gives, can give rise to full uh, fibers, showing the regenerative capacity of muscle stem cells. Unfortunately, as we age, um, <clears throat> the stem cell function as well as the stem cell number um, declines. And this is also <clears throat> coinciding with the condition of sarcopenia or muscle wasting. And you can actually see this in engraftment assays, where if you engraft uh, young cells or aged muscle stem cells, you can see a clear decline in the engraftment capacity of these cells. And we actually have calculated that one third of these uh, muscle stem cells are actually functional in the aged muscles. So <clears throat> this is why we are so interested in finding different factors and different uh, targets to be able to stimulate muscle stem cells and their regenerative capacity in aging. So um, to do this, we actually started with an in silico analysis where we compared different transcriptomist databases um, comparing activated to quiescent stem cells. And here we focused on which receptors were being uh, differentially expressed. And we found that um, <clears throat> one of these receptors that had been understudied in muscle stem cells was EP4, the gene PTGR4, which was upregulated in activated muscle stem cells. So EP4 is a GPCR, and it's, it has a well-known ligand, which is prostaglandin E2. So this is an, a cosinoid. It's not a, a gene transcript. And it's actually synthesized from arachidonic acids, which come from phospholipids in the membrane. And it goes through different enzymatic steps, which are the well-known COX-1 and 2 enzymes, um, and then the prostaglandin synthesis, which will actually give rise to the prostaglandin E2. We can pharmacologically inhibit the reduction of PG2 um, with uh, NSAIDs, such as indomethacin or ibuprofen, and therefore <clears throat> we can actually modulate um, the, the receptor of EP4. So EP4 is the one that's present in muscle stem cells, and it actually has downstream target of uh, cyclic AMP. So for activation of muscle stem cells to occur, we know that after injury, there is a number of uh, inflammatory cells as well as fibroblasts that infiltrate and proliferate in the tissue, which secrete cytokines that lead to the activation and proliferation of these cells. So to test if prostaglandin E2 is one of these cytokines, we actually performed an ELISA of PG2 at different times, time points after injury of the muscle. And here we found that there was a transient peak of PG2 after injury. So then we wondered if PG2 was actually modulating proliferation of these cells. 
So we isolated the cells, put them in culture, and we treated them transiently for just 24 hours with PG2 and found an incredible proliferation of these cells. Additionally, um, we also wanted to know if we could actually inject intramuscularly PG2 and increase endogenous muscle stem cell expansion. So for this, um, we used a PAC7, uh, which is the transcription factor driving that's a characteristic of muscle stem cells. And this PAC7 promoter luciferase mouse model. So in this mouse model, by bioluminescence, we can actually track endogenous muscle stem cell expansion. And here, <clears throat> we injured the mice, injected PG2 three, three days later, and found an incredible increase in um, the levels of endogenous muscle stem cell expansion. Um, so we wondered what were the downstream effectors of PG2 signaling, so we know it's through the EP4 receptor, um, but to know which were the t transcription factors mediating this effect, we performed a transcriptomics of PG2 versus non-PG2 treated muscle stem cells, and we found, uh, we, we focused on the differentially expressed transcription factors, and we found NER1 to be one of the top hits. So NER1 actually recapitulates that a transient peak after injury in muscle and more importantly, if we knock it down by shRNA, we can actually ablate the proliferative effect that PG2 has on these stem cells in culture. Okay. Let's see if this works. Okay. So <clears throat> to further um, understand if PG2 is working specifically on muscle stem cells or on other cell types, we performed a specific conditional knockout of the EP4 receptor in muscle stem cells. So <clears throat> in this mouse model, um, we inject with tamoxifen to ablate the allele of EP4, and then we injure. And surprisingly, in these mice, they're not able to recover from injury, and we can actually see a uh, decrease in their strength uh, production after injury. Additionally, we thought, can we block this pharmacologically? So we, as I said before, NSAIDs can block production of PG2, and in this case, we also used our PAC7 luciferase uh, reporter mouse model. In this case, if we inject NSAIDs three days after injury, we actually saw a reduction in the endogenous muscle stem cell expansion. And this is also coinciding with a decrease in the strength production and force production of muscles. So this got us a lot of attention, because of course, um, you know, in the context of exercise, um, you, we always tend to take um, NSAIDs to avoid pain, but this can actually, from our results, show that it's uh, counterproductive because it will avoid expansion of your stem cells, and therefore it comes with the same, you know, no pain, no gain, because PG2 is actually a pain-mediating molecule. And more for the context of aging, we wondered if PG2 signaling was actually um, dysfunctional in aging. And for this, we know that the aged uh, microenvironment in muscle is quite different from the young. So as I said, in, in the young microenvironment, only after injury do you have these uh, um, peaks of cytokines that lead to activation of muscle stem cells. But in the case of the aged microenvironment, you have an infiltration of many inflammatory cells, senescent cells, and uh, fibroblasts, which lead to this uh, chronic inflammation stage, which can actually lead to aberrant activation and loss of muscle stem cell quiescence. So for this, we, we used a hydrogel single cell microwell system to be able to assay um, muscle stem cell function in, ex vivo in vitro. So for this, uh, we use PEG gels, um, where we use different eight-arm and four-arm PEG gels, um, which have a covalent binding, which can create um, this tunable um, hydrogel with different stiffnesses. So <clears throat> previously in the lab, we identified that 12 kilopascal is the muscle rigidity, and therefore we can engineer these PEGs um, to um, modulate this uh, muscle rigidity and therefore put the muscle stem cells in culture. So. So here you can see this is um, single muscle stem cells we can put in culture. So these are aged. And if you can see, we track them to the single cells. And in the aged muscle stem cells, unfortunately, due, their, due to their intrinsic uh, dysfunction, we can see these mitotic catastrophe events where you have um, increased uh, cell death. Um, but if we give one boost of PG2 in, the, in culture, we can actually see that this is uh, rescued and we have increased proliferation of these cells. So this is quantified here where you see increased proliferation and more dramatically a decrease in the cell death of these cells. 
So we wondered if um, we could perform these um, engraftment assays to assay the self-renewal of these aged muscle stem cells treated with PGE2. So <clears throat> we, take, we took an aged uh, donor, um, we isolated its muscle stem cells infected with a GFP luciferase virus, and then we co-injected with a PGE2 analog and tracked by bioluminescence the level of engraftment. So in this case, an autologous uh, stem cell transplant of aged muscle stem cells um, shows that with PG2 has an increased uh, engraftment compared to the um, vehicle-treated aged muscle stem cells. We wondered if we can circumvent this autologous stem cell transplant and if we could inject it intramuscular to improve function of skeletal muscle. In this case, we injured, and uh, a few days later, we injected PG2 when we have this peak of uh, PG2 singly and analyzed cross-sectional areas of these muscles. And what we found is that the PG2 analog increases the number of muscle stem cells endogenously and also increases the cross-sectional area, which is an indicator of improved regeneration. We also wanted to assay function, and in these muscles treated with PGE2, we could also see increased muscle mass, as you can see here, so both for males and females, as well as increased uh, muscle force. And surprisingly, we can actually find that in age mice treated with a PGE2 uh, analog, we can get to comparable levels to the young mice. Of course, for all these previous assays, we had been using myotoxins, which are um, quite widely used in the field. Of course, that doesn't have much of a translational uh, application. So we wondered if we could actually use um, injury in the context of PG2 injection and uh, see an improvement in function. So for this, we performed an uh, injury uh, regime, I mean, uh, exercise regime of two weeks, and where we injected PG2 for the first five days. And then we assayed function uh, four weeks later. And what we found was incredible two-fold increase in the force production of these aged skeletal muscle, um, which was quite surprising. So as a summary, we have found that PG2 is a one of these cytokines, which is transiently present in injured muscle, which leads to activation of muscle stem cells. And <clears throat> we know that it is signaling through EP4, which in turn can actually uh, increase NER1 transcription factor, which leads to the um, Im improved muscle stem cell function and force restoration during regeneration. Additionally, if we ablate the receptor or if we block it pharmacologically, we know um, that we have aberrant muscle stem cell function and impaired regeneration. And we can see that this is also what is happening in the aged muscle. Of course. More importantly, we can see that a transient PG2 uh, targeting of endogenous muscle stem cells can have a great therapeutic potential. So this I'd just like to finish. I'd like to take questions. Of course, I'd like to... Um, uh, acknowledge my advisor, Helen Blau, and um, just mention that Andrew Ho was part of this uh, study. He's now independent in Paris, uh, doing his research, the whole lab, and of course, funding and collaborators, and I'd like to take any questions. Thank you. The question is, what about the alternative molecules uh, with PGE2? For example, some molecules that young plasma consists of. So uh, did you work with these molecules also? Um, of course, there's a lot of molecules that can have a positive effect on muscle. So there are some studies, for example, like Apollin, which just came out, which also has a positive effect on muscle function. But yes, I'm, I'm sure that there are um, a lot of molecules, especially that are present in exercise, that have a beneficial effect um, for muscle stem cell function. Uh, what is first? Uh, decreasing of uh, concentration PG2 or dysregulation of this signaling? And uh, second question is, uh, what do you think about um, gene therapy uh, for increasing PG2 receptors? So um, for the first question, we're not sure. Of course, we're um, not sure if the receptor is the one that's uh, uh, um, being lost due to other uh, causes, or if it's the PG2 molecule, which is the one that's being lost. Um, so we're still trying to figure that out. 
And for the second question, um, yes, we, we could think of gene therapy potentially to um, increase the levels of the receptor of one of the downstream targets. But since we have found that a uh, boost of this analog, it, it works quite well to improve function, we think that it might not, it might not be necessary to go through the gene therapy route. Yeah. Here, please. Yes, Adelaide, a very, very nice presentation. I was wondering, in, the, in, the in, vit in your in vitro studies, mm -hmm. have you looked at the effect of the confined three-dimensional and aligned uh, environment, I guess, yeah. for these cells? Yeah, so, I mean, the most we have done is fiber culture, which is the most, uh, you know, <laughs> natural uh, in microenvironment, but we haven't done it with the hydrogels. We've only done 2D um, culture of uh, that for now. <laughs> yes. Um, so Charlotte Peterson's group, uh, mm -hmm. they uh, selectively knocked out yeah. muscle satellite cells and didn't seem to show any effect on sarcopenia at all, despite the fact that obviously they had a poor regenerative response mm -hmm. after that. Whereas you're saying that <clears throat> simply knocking out uh, this receptor that's important in muscle stem cells uh, does have an effect on strength, force generation, mm -hmm. like functional assays. So. Do you have any notion of how to reconcile those findings? Yeah, so of course we were well aware of that study where they knock out, well, they ablate muscle stem cells. They don't see uh, any difference in muscle function as they age. Um, so, I mean, the only plausible explanation that we have is um, maybe the different treatments we're giving to the mice, you know, how they're uh, housed, um, because um, they've been sedentary their whole lives, so it's hard to say that muscle stem cells might not be playing a role um, in muscle. Are your mouse kept exercise through their whole life? No, we haven't, but we do see this reduction in strength and in, in so it, it might be leading to different uh, downstream targets, maybe it's um, enhanced differentiation or something of that sort, which is actually leading to the loss of muscle mass and muscle strength, which might be different to what um, Charlotte's work is being done. Yeah, I don't have an <laughs> explanation for it. Thank you. More questions? Well, if there are more questions, they will be asked uh, afterwards. So Thank we you. are mo moving to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you.